Welcome, everybody, to our weekly Ecosystem Office Hours call. I am your host, Jinx, and we are joined, as always, by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. We'll kick things off with our community updates with uh, Zach. Should I talk really slow so Shane has an opportunity to jump in? Boy, he better. I'm be hitting him on all channels. <laughs> <laughs> uh so uh, the big one this week is we have a new PNF employee, Larissa. So she started on Monday. She's going to be taking on a lot of social media and some uh, community-related uh, marketing efforts. So uh, if you see her name around, I think she also posted on the forum. Um, but yeah, give her a warm welcome. She's fantastic, and we're really excited to have her on the team. It should, should superpower our marketing team in a lot of ways, having a dedicated person focusing to that. So I don't, I don't know if there's a... Clap emoji or something I can throw in here. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell is. her she's got to show up to these calls to get the claps. Good point. I will message her to let her know that uh, these are happening. I'm sure she's just got a million things she's trying to sort with a new schedule. So, oh, I'm um, sure. Uh, the good news, though, is that there is a marketing office hours tomorrow. Um, so you can see that in the Discord events calendar as well as the Google one, and I'm sure Larissa will be there for that. So this is the first uh, biweekly marketing hours. You know, we've had some um, some people in the the den asking for, I guess, more like input and more ideas. So an opportunity for anybody who thinks um, they have the answers or could help with the marketing initiatives to jump into those office hours and support. Um, it's really a, a chance for people to have a one-on-one -on -one with ads and, I don't know, Brainstorm, discuss ideas, ask for changes, whatever you need. Nice. So I'll that's happening there. tomorrow. I think it's quite early uh, for those of us on the West Coast, but for East Coast in Europe, it should be a good time. Um, you may have noticed that Dermis, Dermot is out of office this week, so if you do need any um, Shane, me, whoever else. Um, and then the last one and the biggest one is Retro PGF has kicked off for voting. So if you are a voter... Um, please, please, please go in and take a peek and vote. We have office hours today uh, from 1 to 3 Pacific, and we're going to run them again next week, Monday and Wednesday. So you can come in and ask questions, or you can just do your voting live with us. But um, if you run into any issues or have any concerns, please DM us. But we're looking to get those votes in sooner rather than later um, and make sure that everybody knows the process and we've answered any questions. So again, 1 to 3 Pacific today, um, or you can DM me, and I'm happy to make some private time to go through any questions or concerns you might have. Currently we have two of 79 voters participating and I will, I will say that Jinx, you're doing pretty well. So oh, nice. thank you for all that you do for us. Hey, it's uh, it's kind of cool to, uh, to get that feedback. And uh, I, I will be going through and adding all mine as well. Obviously there are a lot of uh, important contributors that are up for some retro PGF. So we'll get that out there. Exactly. And, and at the very least, I would really encourage everybody to try to log in and make sure they have access to submit a ballot, um, even if you don't plan on doing it soon, just to make sure there were no mistakes or, or errors with um, any of the wallets. So um, again, even if you just have like 10 minutes today to log in and make sure it's working. And I think I've talked enough to get Shane here. So back to you, Jane. <laughs> Beautiful. So uh, we'll kick into protocol updates next uh, with Shane. Yo, uh, yeah, uh, the end of this week uh, will be pretty uh, pretty exciting because we'll have the uh, Shannon SDK fully separated from uh, the main repo um, right now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right now some uh, work is being done on just updating the docs and things of that nature. Um, obviously, after uh, after with, with this now being separated, uh, a big focus is going to become integrations. So getting uh, the this SDK uh, in the hands of builders um, and then in uh, into our tools. So a obvious one is something like gateway server uh, so that it can operate on Shannon uh, in a similar fashion to how it operates on Morse. Um, originally, uh, in the Morse version of uh, gateway server it's uh, uh it's kind of like a custom client uh like a lightweight client that's being run uh the cool thing is is with the sdk it should actually be super simple it's just plugging in the sdk and off to the races so yeah 
gonna start um PNF's gonna gonna start scoping out uh next steps with uh, uh with that specifically uh basically starting next week but yeah having the SDK as a independent um uh independent and fully on its own uh uh library will be awesome a lot of a lot of cool things that people can utilize it for um on top of that uh lean client um is code ready so like basically the lean client equivalent in uh, uh in shannon uh is code ready so uh that's something that we'll begin testing out in in the next phase of, of testnet um work continues on the relay mining um uh some yeah uh basically work continues it's uh, uh actually oshansky got it uh hooked up to uh, uh to grafana and was able to start getting in some um some live data from their uh uh from the work being done so things are progressing there uh and then let's see i think uh yeah some updates to the docs are actually happening with uh, a lot of content that i've been making um i believe ad said that starting today they're going to start uh taking a lot of shannon content and putting it directly in the docs now um for the past couple of weeks i've worked on kind of writing up this full overview of of everything shannon all the different players how they interact um, so the idea is someone would be able to go and just read that and get a full understanding of the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so that is currently being adapted into our docs on top of some other pieces that I believe um, marketing is going to be pushing out that highlights uh, certain areas of that. So folks that want to start getting into the uh, more more into Shannon and understanding all these different actors and how they work together, how tokenomics will kind of play into it. Uh, that will all be uh, in the docs here. Um, I, I guess at least starting today, uh, they're starting to make some updates. So uh, we'll uh, I'll let you all know when everything is fully there. But that's pretty much it on the uh, protocol side specifically. If um, uh, I did also post a uh, a proposal, uh, which um, is part of a initiative we're calling let's go shannon um and i believe uh we can have some time to talk about it uh here so i won't get into the weeds of it but uh yeah dig. yeah we'll dig into that after our updates sounds good beautiful olshansky anything to add from a protocol perspective sorry i'm muting uh nothing to add today Beautiful. Thanks. Sir. Actually, I do have one more thing to add. So I do want to emphasize um, with uh, the public testnet, uh, PNF is uh, basically PNF is going to be doing a retro PGF round for uh, testnet participants. This is going to happen later on this year. Um, but uh, that is something that is absolutely in the works. And so if you want to be able to be a part of that uh, that round, one of the best ways is to participate in Shannon, which means participating in uh, Testnet. So just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of alpha there. Uh, more official cons on that will uh, will be coming out at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure when an announcement of when exactly the next retro PGF rounds is, but at least uh, internally with PNF, we absolutely want to make Shannon a highlight of the next retro PGF round, which includes uh, participation in testnet. So uh, yeah, it for anyone who has not spun up uh, a supplier in uh, this testnet or participated, this is definitely the time to do that. Our goals for this version of testnet is to really test the deployment uh, of uh, gateways, the deployment of um, suppliers, and get all the feedback we need on kind of that very basic level. And then in phase two is when we're going to start really testing things like relay mining. Uh, we'll have the lean client version out. Uh, and some claims and proof stuff uh, and some scaling and stress testing. So all that's going to be coming up in, in, in phase two. But if you want to participate in phase one on the deployment, uh, the deployment scripts and, and uh, packages themselves, 
uh, this is the time to do it, uh, especially if you want to be a part of the retro PGF round coming later uh, later this year. Beautiful and. and uh... Just as a for for anyone who's either listening to this call live or listening to the recording afterwards, I've spent a lot of time talking with PNF about the motivations around retro PGF and and the continued and ongoing retro mm -hmm. PGF funds that will be uh, uh, further rounds in the future. And if you think that um, you know sockets and bounties and proposals and all that are are more work than you feel like doing but you're contributing to the growth of the protocol in any meaningful way and that includes like you know being part of testnet and things along that line retro pgf offers you an opportunity to to be compensated for that so uh, keep it in mind and and i would encourage you to uh, participate in whatever way you can and in the future to add your uh, submission to the, re the retro PGF rounds. Moving on to our gateway updates, uh, Gabby, Fred, you guys got any Grove updates? Nothing major for my side today, thanks. You got it. I see Blades here, anything uh, from Nodis? Uh, nothing major on my side either. You got it. Uh, Raid Guild uh, or Porters? Yep, also quiet from our side as well. Excellent. And uh, DevDAO, y'all got any updates? Uh, not really, just a slight timeline update. Um, work's coming together a little bit slowly, uh, just due to ability contributors to the DAO, but we're hoping to kind of meaningfully start testing at the end of this month. So let's say optimistically we might start sending relays and testing Sort of right at the end of this month or early next month. Um, but always looking good, just it's uh, moving a little slow on our end at the minute. Nice. And it's already interesting uh, having a list of gateways to go through. I think before too long, gateway updates may just be raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Well, if we don't have uh, anything else from a general uh, updates perspective, then I want to give the mic to uh, Shane and let's talk a little bit about Gandalf. Cool. Yeah. Uh, pretty much uh, published uh, pup forty or pup thirty four, which is uh, what I'm calling Gandalf two point uh, A lot of people, um, a lot of people are aware of the original Gandalf proposal that uh, I put in uh, basically August of last year, um, and. What Gandalf was all about is basically the economic effects uh, and advantages of basically changing the max chains parameter from 15 to 1. Um, and so this is the, the follow-up to that. Uh, there were actually some protocol changes that needed to happen that were uh, enabled in February. Uh, because if we were to change the max chains, it actually wouldn't be enforced on the network. So that would have created a bunch of issues if it wasn't actually enforced. So uh, in February, um, H5 Law particularly uh, championed the code change that made max chains enforceable, which means the DAO now has the opportunity to actually use max chains in a way that uh, they seem beneficial. So what this proposal is, is it's just suggesting going from uh, 15 to 1 uh, it's inside of kind of a larger initiative that uh, uh, I'm calling Let's Go Shannon. And the the concept of this is we can either keep doing what we're doing in Morse, uh, like not change anything, just keep trucking the way we're uh, going down the same path that we're going with Morse. Or what we could do is we could intentionally uh, allow certain uh, using parameters change things slightly inside of Morse so that uh, it's more in line with where Shannon is. So we can either go with the status quo or we can go with Shannon. So let's go Shannon. Let's go in down that path instead. And what that will do is that will create a lot of benefits down the road, especially once we get to transitioning from Morse to Shannon. There's going to need to be a lot of transitionings happening 
And if there's major transitioning also needing to happen with how providers balance chains uh, and how uh, uh, in adding new actors to the to the network, there's just all sorts of things that are going to have to all be balanced. And it's going to be a, a decent sized migration. This is this is no small thing um, migrating from literally one code base to another code base. So it's going to be a large transition. Uh, and so. They're really, I don't, uh, I, I'm open to hear what people have to say about it, um, but it seems like there's a lot of value with uh, making certain transitions now that actually set us up for Shannon. And then the migration could actually be focused on the things, um, other important things uh, that can't be dealt with inside of Morse. So that's kind of the initiative, the Let's Go Shannon initiative. This is the first proposal, which is focused on changing max chains. Um, I, I laid out basically what the motives are, what the benefits are. Uh, ben Van actually did a great job in November of explaining max chains and the effect uh, that it can have with bringing in new specialists from all these other communities that, uh, of all these other chains that Pocket serves. Those community, uh, community of node runners inside of each of those chains could actually come to pocket if we uh, didn't also require them to run 15 or 14 other chains. So there's a lot of benefit to allowing pocket to be accessible to any specialist of any chain to start generating rewards. And max chains going from 15 to 1 is how you do that, uh, is how you can make that way more approachable. Um, and so, and then in terms of the implementation, uh, how would we implement this? Uh, there is, uh, we've kind of laid out a process that, uh, is progressive. We don't want to change it from 15 to one and then have the system kind of be in shock from needing to figure out how do we now balance all of our nodes across, uh, these chains in a, in a different way than what we were doing before. So we don't want that. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of progressively do it. And so right now we have four steps laid out going from 15 to 8 to 3 to 1. And what that would do is it would allow with each step, it would allow the network to uh, have to take, um, you know, take uh, their nodes and distribute them across uh, instead of 15 chains, it'd be across uh, each node can only be staked to eight chains. So they would have to make changes with each of these steps, but it would allow the network to naturally find its balance uh, in a progressive way versus doing it just one time, one shot, where we could have chains that suddenly don't have any nodes at all. Uh, and people have to figure out, uh, people would then have to figure that out and then stake, and that would create a whole issue with, uh, with something like QoS for gateways. So we want to keep gateways in mind and we want to make sure that we're not doing anything too dramatic that would affect the uh, uh, gateways, um, the quality of service for them. So the idea is to do it progressively and PNF will kind of be able to help uh, orchestrate this, kind of navigate this, provide some some guides for distributor or for um, providers on how to distribute nodes and uh, uh, you know some possible tips on uh, the strategies they should look into and uh, but Ultimately, at the end of the day, this will be something that the whole community and ecosystem will 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 kind of go through. But I think if we do it in kind of a measured, aggressive, one step at a time way, uh, we can get down to a max chains of one. And then at that point, anyone running any chain node could then join Pocket and start generating uh, generating revenue. And that's that's awesome. That's exactly what Pocket's supposed to be. Uh, there shouldn't have to be a, a barrier to entry where you have to also run 14 other chains if you want to generate network average. So that will be really exciting for uh, expanding the node ecosystem because uh, there really hasn't been growth in the node ecosystem in terms of new players or, or new participants uh, in the staking ecosystem itself um, or in the node ecosystem itself because it's such a barrier to entry right now. And we want to set Morse up so that when we go into Shannon, we're already at a max chains of one. Uh, and the whole ecosystem already understands how to operate within the max chains of one. And then that will be something that will not need to be figured out when we are doing the uh, Morse to Shannon migration. 
So wanted to hear other folks' thoughts or questions. Uh, this is kind of a time that we can start flushing some of this out if there's any uh, concerns or any areas that you know should be taken into account that maybe weren't. Um, but yeah, happy to talk about it. I'll go ahead and go on the record saying that uh, you know I originally thought this idea was uh, a technical burden that would be difficult to implement across the network, but. Uh, over time in those discussions, especially with uh, Ben Van's perspective on it, uh, I've, I've very much come around to be strongly in support of it. And from the layman's terms, like those two reasons are very strong. Uh, one, that it makes it easier for node runners within our ecosystem to participate as node runners uh, without having to take on the infrastructure costs of supporting 15 chains on every node with GeoMesh. And everything else, it's, you know, it, it, nodes got a lot more powerful, but they got a lot more expensive and complex along the way. So rolling that back uh, in this perspective is a good idea, I've been convinced. But uh, in my mind, probably almost more important is how easy it makes it for people who are running nodes for other ecosystems to just turn on a pocket node. And one of the things that's important from an economy perspective is a continued sync uh, of uh, demand for the token, which uh, opening up node running to a lot larger audience overall means that a lot more folks are picking up 15k pocket to stake or wherever we end up if we start uh, um, playing with those numbers as well. So it creates demand within the token economy itself that I think everyone agrees would be good for that. Um, the one note that I think I want to add is that uh, we need a really good way to calculate the ratios of performance for each chain based on relays versus total nodes staked. And if somebody wants to build that calculator who's really smart at data analytics, I would love you a lot. And that's probably worth a socket or something like that. So other thoughts and questions about Gandalf? Yeah, one one quick comment on uh, kind of a calculator. Um, I, I did uh, I do link to a spreadsheet that makes it possible uh, to uh, to kind of see what the balance is, what balance would be on any given chain with uh, max chains at different parameters. So what that would allow is someone to uh, like a, a provider now that maybe uh you know has five or six hundred nodes they could um they would be able to kind of see okay how many nodes uh should be in each of these chains what percentage should i take now that's not going to be real time though so this would be where what i created at least allows people to kind of look into the future of like where would balance be at you know uh with this many relays um, or, you know, with this chains, max chain setting. Uh, but what it does not do is provide real time, uh, you know, real time feedback uh, from like what's happening directly on the network so people can respond in real time. So that does not exist. Um, that would be a great socket. Uh, if, it, and my, my spreadsheet actually might be a way that people could at least get some of the, uh, yeah, a, a initial algorithms on, on where nodes should be to, ultimately have balance in the network. Um, but yeah, uh, that that definitely would be an awesome socket uh, to do because then people could do it in real time. Um, I don't know if PNF, or, or sorry, I don't know if Pocket Scan has APIs that people could utilize inside some kind of, you know, application that they make or if this has to go through them or, you know, if they have data accessible for other people to make tools or, if, you know, they're the, only ones who can make tools uh, with their data. I'm not really sure exactly where that is, so that might be worth considering if someone wants to build this. There might be APIs from Pocket Scan that could be used to help calculate, uh, you know, help pull data to be able to do calculations. Yeah, I mean, they definitely have the data, right? Because it would right. be uh, a comparative analysis of number of nodes per chain versus total relays per chain daily uh, to generate a sense of, of uh, what the per node earning for supporting that chain was. And I know that there's been a number of folks uh, who have um, 
done better than network average on a regular basis because they're supporting an under supported smaller chain and getting a larger share of the total relays served. So it'd be good math to have. Yeah, I think I think one of the uh, maybe a pocket scan had a uh, at least an ability to see if to click on a chain and see not only how many nodes are staked there, but how many of each provider is staked there. Um, that would be that would be super helpful uh, because then people could evaluate, OK, uh, you know, how many different parties are on this chain and then be able to, you know, keep keep an eye on that when they're trying to find balance, because if someone decides to uh, drop a chain entirely because they want to focus their nodes on other chains, uh, that could that drop in in uh, in nodes would suddenly make that chain under provision, which means its rewards would be would be a lot most likely because that's the benefit of going from max chains from 15 to something like one is if there's any kind of imbalance, um, those that are uh, chains that are under provision, meaning they uh, they are there's not uh, there's less nodes on that chain than what there should be for uh, for network balance. Um, those nodes will actually be rewarded uh, handsomely compared to anyone that is on a chain that is uh, over provision, meaning it has too many nodes on it. Um, so the so this really will come down to how how well people that are commanding hundreds or thousands of nodes uh, are able to, you know, truly distribute nodes in a balanced fashion, which ultimately helps the network as a whole um, to have that kind of balance and to have the economics of pocket be such that uh, balance is incentivized. Um, yeah, that'll actually provide a lot of benefits to the ecosystem as a whole. So, other thoughts about uh, Gandalf in general? Is there anyone that that is hesitant on wanting this, embracing this? Uh, any any objections to it? I would love to flush any of those out uh, or talk about them and uh, address them directly. If if anyone so has, Miss Kitty asked uh, in the sidebar chat here. Uh, does it factor in GeoZone mesh clients? If one of the goals is to get folks from other communities to join, would the idea of running nodes in different geographic regions to get optimal pocket rewards be counterproductive to that? Yeah, uh, that's a great observation because yeah. uh, that's exactly why in Shannon we want to uh, we want to avoid basically having meshing in the first place because what meshing basically does is hey, if you want to get network average rewards, you need to run this one node, this one pocket node uh, in three regions. So it's duplicating that node essentially in three regions. That's what meshing is. Um, so if you have meshing, it just means basically that you have to run your node in all these regions to get network average. If you're not running it in all these regions, then you will basically get a third or you know something of uh what other uh people would generate uh what the network average is generating so you're absolutely right that uh there is still a hiccup with inside morse to where if someone is running a uh running a node for you know some uh for a smaller chain like say like scroll if someone is running a scroll node um they won't be getting network average unless they do have that distributed uh, to other um, uh, to at least one other region. Uh, they could potentially get network average if they're distributed across um, maybe two regions. Sometimes if you're just doing Europe and uh, 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 Asia. Um, so it's not perfect. And Shannon will basically provide the perfect solution where you can stake in one region. Uh, or you can stake you when you stake your node and you run that node, that node runs in one place. Uh, it can't be, um, you know, run in three different places acting as if it was run in one place, which is what meshing is. Um, so nodes will run in one place. And that is where we will have 
what I would say, you know, uh, the, the most optimized uh, environment for new node runners to join. So GeoMesh is something that they would have to potentially address, um, but this does open up a lot of strategies where even if a chain is under provisioned, um, you could be generating, if a chain is under provisioned, you could be generating more than network average, um, even without uh, being geo uh, just because maybe there's just not a lot of people supporting that chain. Um, and if that's the case, then you could absolutely generate network average if it's uh, even slightly under provisioned. So, uh, so there's still strategies out there that people will be able to do. Um, but the real the benefit is here, um, uh, just you know, like actually, one one more thought on this: if someone were to run a node in Europe uh, in an optimal place to where they can serve U.S. and Europe in a very efficient manner. Um, there's a lot of uh, possibility here uh, for them to be able to essentially generate network average rewards um, because most suppliers already require 30% of reward uh, reward share. So that's 30% off the top already of running a node. And then if you're able to service two regions with one deployment, which is very possible uh, in in either Europe or um, uh, U.S. serving each other uh, a lot of the time, then uh, yeah, you could technically be in two regions or one region, uh, still serving two regions, uh, kind of barely, but um, because you don't have to pay that thirty percent, uh, that thirty percent uh, uh, cost to the providers themselves, uh, you could basically be generating the the return that someone that's staked with you know a provider that's in three regions would be. Um, uh, would be making. So there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of different strategies that could start coming out of this, even though geo meshing is, is still a thing. But ultimately, the goal with Shannon is to eliminate geo meshing. So one node equals one instance. Uh, and that is how someone could generate network average. That's the ultimate dream. Yeah, Fred added in the uh, the chat that uh, I think this will be a net boon to quality of service as well, since right now many node runners feel forced to stake for chains they aren't experts in, and even sometimes game RPCs to appear to be staked. Uh, yeah, I mean, if 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 you're not going to pull network average unless you're staked to 15 chains, then you know you're going to go 15 chains. Uh, so I, I did want to clarify uh, something that you said along the way in there. Um, when Shannon goes live, GeoMesh simply does not exist anymore in the way that this is being structured, correct? We're hoping that that isn't something that we've fully scoped out yet. So full disclosure, we haven't scoped it fully out yet. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but if people remember the original, uh, some of the original, before it was called Shannon, it was just called V1. Yep. And uh, a lot of the original documentation talked about um, geo zones so you can actually search the docs for geo zones and you can see quite a few references to geo zones um, that was because the original spec were to have where not only do you stake what chain you want to serve you also stake in a region right uh and so basically pocket has regions that then you stake your node into and if you're stoked in if you're staked in one region you don't receive uh relays from another region so that needs to be scoped out Right, that that absolutely needs to be scoped out. It's not a uh, it's not a like top priority right now with where we're at in the testnet phases, but that will absolutely be scoped out. Uh, you know, potentially potentially in um, uh, either alpha test testnet three or uh, beta, and see what exactly would be required to make that happen. This could this could even be something where a um, uh, a possible grant or something could could potentially, uh, or a bounty, I should say, could be attached to something like this. So, so yeah. So, moral of the story, that hasn't been fully scoped out. It's been kind of specked out uh, in in terms of how it could operate. Um, and a lot of that actually goes back to some of the V1, uh, the original V1 documentation. But in terms of having it in Shannon, our current iteration, um, yeah, still more work needs to be done there. But that is the ultimate goal. Um, and there's been a lot of work around this uh, uh, in the past. I know that pocket scan 
did release a paper uh, called like balance and fairness in V1 or something like that. Um, and yeah, they were arguing for one one chain and one region per node because that would create the most optimal uh, environment for uh, for node runners to be able to generate rewards, regardless of how you know, re regardless of who you are or where you're staking. Um, it creates the the most balanced way that people could uh, participate in the uh, in pocket on the supplier side. And the expectation, I mean, I remember seeing uh, as far back as State of the Union, um, the idea of having effectively gateways in every major city in the world, if we can get, you know, that broad of a gateway versus adoption, um, that would reasonably address some of the concerns around like regional latency and such, wouldn't it? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? With more gateways regionally distributed around the world, we have uh, you know shorter paths to leap in usage of the network. So QoS kind of works itself out from a regional uh, uh, perspective with greater adoption. Yeah, yeah. It, QoS in general, uh, I don't think would be affected by either Max Chains or um, uh, like a, in in an environment where Pocket is running Max Chains of one. And Pocket does not have uh, geo meshing because maybe it's like geo zone staking or something. Um, in any of those cases, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't affect QoS uh, in any meaningful way um, because basically, uh, in, instead of someone having to do all the work of uh, mapping out, you know, like in a using uh, geo region DNS. Uh, instead of using geo region DNS uh, routing to essentially route the same pocket node to multiple continents, uh, it would just happen essentially on chain. So uh, this would actually make sessions way more. Um, this would make sessions much more uh, uh, efficient because instead of someone being paired with a bunch of random nodes uh, in a session, and you know maybe half of them are uh, in your region, a gateway would actually, in a particular region, would would be um, uh, would only be matched with nodes in their particular region. So their whole session could actually be fully utilized uh, in that specific region. So there are some efficiencies that actually would 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 could potentially come out of this. Um, but again, I don't want to speak too too early before things have been fully scoped out. But at least theoretically. It would actually, it could actually improve, uh, improve a lot of uh, uh, QoS simply because you, each gateway is only connected to the nodes in that region. And Breezy asked in chat, what would be done on chain and Shannon to keep actors from developing and deploying their own version of the client to make GeoMesh capable again? Uh, and it sounds like the GeoZone uh, variable in staking itself. Yeah. would potentially do that if each account is only capable of one geo zone. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly it. So if you stake in a geo zone, uh, sessions would essentially be created uh, at, not only is a session created for you know a, a given chain and a gateway, there's just one more variable in there, which is what geo zone is this session for. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, that that's how it works. So then uh, a gate because right now also how it works with like Morse is um, Grove has uh, these app sessions that uh, the, or these uh, application stakes that are essentially like global. So they have to put so they run the same app stake in multiple regions, right? Uh, they're all utilizing the same app stake, but each gateway is then testing, OK, which nodes are actually good in uh in europe and then the the actual instance in uh asia is checking to see which nodes are actually good in asia so they have to actually build out an infrastructure to uh share this app stake and then uh uh and then you know do qos on that app stake and everything like that whereas where we would like to get with shannon where when a uh, when a gateway, basically each of those instances would just get their own session with their local nodes. That's just way more efficient. And then that one instance in, say, Europe 
it gets a session with only Europe nodes, uh, any one stake in that region. Uh, and then their QoS is much more straightforward um, and they have way more options to access. And if, uh, and, and so actually what happens is you would have, each gateway would actually have significantly more sessions to choose from, uh, choose nodes from. And uh, yeah, it would be, it, it could actually create a lot more efficiencies uh, than kind of the way that it's operating now, where the same app stake has to be shared across all regions. And then each region needs to fig figure out which of these 20 nodes in this one app stake is, uh, uh, is good for each region. Um, it just, each one would just have their own sessions. That's ultimately where this could go, um, which is what we would need to fully vet out. Is there anyone on the call now who is, um, you know, leaning against the proposal for any economic or technical reason that you'd like to bring up? Well, Shane, this might be one of the easiest proposals you've ever put up. Also, one more, one more thought on the geomeshing as well. What this also does is bring a significantly lot more data uh, that can be extrapolated from the chain itself in terms of like geo regions. Because like right now, uh, you know, Gateway Server had to be um, uh, an API had to be added to Gateway Server so that someone like Pocket Scan can get geo uh, geo data. Um, that's because there's nothing on chain. However, if uh, uh, with on chain region staking, what would happen is on chain would actually have all the information on how many, uh, uh, how much relays are happening in what regions, uh, what nodes are, you know, what providers are being profitable in what regions versus other regions. Like you could get all that data now, all that data would be unlocked again. Um, and it wouldn't have to be in an opt-in fashion. It would be natively in the chain itself. So that would be huge. We could go, we could reverse time, go right back to where it was before, where people were looking at regions, figuring out which regions they wanted to go into, figure out where, where is it more profitable, where is there, you know, which regions are underserved, and it creates a lot more competitive uh, node running, which was fantastic. Um, once uh, once Pocket lost all that information, it's virtually impossible to get to 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 really be able to analyze uh, and come up with a strategy based on data. Uh, and so that's where the cool thing with uh, Gateway Servers they're kind of doing it in an opt-in fashion, but it could be in an on-chain fashion, and that would absolutely happen with geozoning because the network itself is tracking how much. Uh, how much traffic, how many nodes, and all this stuff are happening in each zone. So that would be huge, um, huge benefit to the ecosystem as a whole. We're coming up on the top of the hour now. Any uh, final thoughts, questions, or anything else that needs to be asked or talked about this week? Sounds like we're all groovy. Appreciate your time on the call this week, Shane. Uh, it's it's uh, probably one of the most thought about and discussed uh, for some time uh, proposals about a change to the network architecture. So uh, I feel good about it. Clearly, uh, everyone seems to be generally in favor. So I don't foresee any uh, you know long debates over the proposal. Uh, I look forward to getting this thing rolling. Well, then, on that note, we're pretty close to the top of the hour, so we'll call it for the week. Uh, I do see Nick is typing, so I'm going to hang on a second to make sure we account for that. Oh, great call and awesome progression. Agreed on both counts. All right, y'all. Well, then I'll see y'all again, uh, same time, same channel next week.
All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.